Hi, um, thanks for coming to this. It's really great to be here. I'm glad this is happening uh, virtually, if not in Greece. Uh, thank you to the conference organizers for making this happen. So today I'm going to be talking to you about scary music, um, which is nicely related to the wonderful keynote we just heard. So this is it's nice that it's related. <laughs> um, so I, I do a lot of research on scary film music. That's my main project right now. And when I was looking through um, literature on scary film music, I saw a lot of scream-like descriptors being used informally to describe music of this genre. Uh, for example, this is from a paper on Bernard Herrmann's score for the film Psycho. So he described the infamous shower murder scene uh, music as screeching upward to the sandy. Oh. You can hear that example, right? I hope, yeah, hopefully that works. I tested it earlier, so it should, should work. Um, also, there's a, just, there was a piece about one of the newer films, um, It Follows. The music is by a dead piece, and they described, or disaster piece, not dead piece, <laughs> disaster piece, and they described the music as sounding like fire alarm-like screeches. Here's an example of that. Um, finally, and I have another example describing the music from The Shining, which we just heard about a moment ago, um, particularly the piece Polymorphia by Penderecki. Uh, so it was described as a screaming, discombobulating climax of mind-bending power, which is a pretty extreme description. But it fits for some pretty extreme music, actually. Um, so my main question when I was reading all these descriptions is, do these scary film soundtrack excerpts actually sound like human screams? Um, or is it just kind of metaphorical? So there's, and this, this question fits well into um, an area of music cognition research, which is focused on looking for vocal behaviors in musical behaviors. Uh, there's a history in many areas of music of relying on vocal behaviors in order to describe musical ones. Um, and some music cognition scholars, such as myself, are interested in empirically investigating such instances of mimicry. And particularly, I focus on whether or not there are ethological signals present in music. So ethological signals uh, are behaviors intended to communicate with a fellow member of one species. And particularly, um, they are meant to cause them to react in an intended way. So in humans, ethological signals can be smiling, crying, um, screaming. All of these are very clear signals to another human that also are supposed to elicit an intended reaction from them. If you're crying, you want to be comforted. If you're screaming, you obviously need help. Um, that's how the signal is working. So there are theories that part of how music might communicate emotion is by mimicking human ethological vocal signals. So I wanted to see with this research uh, if scary music is doing just that. So the main question is, does scary music actually mimic human screams in order to scare us? So what are the acoustic features of screams? Uh, they're very loud. They have a wide range of frequencies. They're typically higher in pitch uh, and they have a high amount of roughness. So the other features are not really that specific to screams, like laughter can be loud, it can have a wide range of frequencies and it can be higher in pitch. So the main um, attribute of screams that's really unique is this roughness feature. Um, roughness, it's, you know, it, it was mentioned in the previously in the keynote, but um, it's sort of a coarse grating or harsh sound. It, it's defined in, in quite a few ways, uh, which makes it a little bit confusing when you're researching it. Um, and we chose to operationalize it in a very specific way. Uh, we chose to use this modulation power spectrum measurement and to operationalize roughness in the same way that uh, Luke Arnell did in his previous paper in 2015 when he was researching screams. So the modulation power spectrum, unfortunately, is not the most accessible measurement because it's fairly complicated. Uh, it's a two-dimensional fast Fourier transform of a spectrogram. So it's essentially doing a two-dimensional tra uh, fast Fourier transform twice in a row. And it shows you the irregularity of a sound, so the, sort of the power of both the temporal and spectral modulations of the sound. The way I like to describe it um, is it's sort of a fingerprint of a sound. It's a really nice ID of the timbre that is more effective than just pitch or loudness um, tend to be. So just to give you a visualization of this measurement, we have a, a, a waveform and it's being transformed into a spectrogram using a 2D FFT. 
And then that spectrogram is being transformed again, and you get to this modulation power spectrum. And the two axes you have, you have the temporal modulation along the X axis, and you have spectral modulation along the Y axis here. And so the temporal modulations you can think of, this is the frequency of the amplitude modulations. And spectral modulations are measuring the amount of frequencies active within a range of available frequencies. And I really recommend, if you really want to get in-depth um, understanding of this measurement, to uh, look at the Elliott and Tunison 2009 article. They have this nice figure, and I think they do a pretty good explanation of it, um, if you want more detail on that. Also, the color in a spectrogram, uh, just to remind you, it, it represents sound intensity for those particular frequencies over time. The color on um, the modulation power spectrum represents the power and magnitude of that particular occurrence of temporal modulation and spectrum modulation on the, on the graph. So what's, in, what's nice about the MPS, I'll, I'm going to call it MPS for now just to save some breath, um, the different areas of the MPS uh, communicate various things. So um, here on the right, we have this figure from Arnold's paper, Luke's paper, and you see that part of it communicates fundamental frequency, which gives you some information on gender. Um, and some of it is the slow fluctuations of actual speaking and meaning. But what we're interested in are those uh, orangish yellow tan patches, which are the roughness zone. So before uh, Luke's paper on screen, we didn't have a great hypothesis for what the human voice uses that, that uh, range of the modulation power spectrum for, or even if, it, if we do use it. Uh, and so what's really special is that the only human vocal signal that utilizes that area of the modulation power spectrum is a scream, to our knowledge so far with research. And you can see that really well in the image on the left. You see an MPS of a scream and an MPS of a sentence. And you see that there's so much power in that range of about uh, 30 to 150 hertz along the temporal modulation uh, axes is really, really strong for screens and, and completely non-existent for the sentence. So this, in our study, we want to see is the scream and press like fingerprint, um, if it's going to be like the kind of scream like music MPS fingerprint. Oh, so here's another demonstration real quick for you. You can see we have the waveform, we have the spectrogram, and we have the modulation power spectrum for a scream and then a neutral scream, which is essentially a held ah sound as you'll hear in a moment. It's a scream. Uh, this is an ah sound. And again, you can see how with the spectrogram having a lot of temporal and spectral modulations, you get a lot of power in that, in that roughness zone of the MPS, whereas the neutral scream, you really don't see a lot of power happening in that region. Okay. Oh, yeah. I highlight him. There you go. And so, um, Back to our main question. My main question is, does scream-like music have the same roughness feature as and is perceived similarly to human screams? So we had two studies in order to test this question or investigate this question. The first one was an acoustic analysis uh, project. So we took the MPS of screams, non-screaming vocalizations, scream-like music, and non-scream-like music and compared them. And in the second study, uh, we did we did a behavioral study where we had participants listen to all four categories and rate the valence and arousal ratings um, of each. So our hypotheses were uh, for the first study that the mean power of the modulation power spectrum within the roughness region would be similar for screams and scream-like music and would be significantly greater for screams compared to non-screaming vocalizations and for scream-like music compared to non-scream-like uh, music. Whereas our second hypothesis was that roughness uh, would correlate negatively with valence ratings and positively with arousal ratings across domains, so for both music and vocal stimuli. So for the first experiment, uh, our stimuli, well, for both experiments, um, was in a two by two factorial design. So we had sound type and then scream likeness. So there are the four categories you see. Uh, we have non scream like music and scream like music and then non-screaming vocalizations and screams. We had 50 audio recordings of each type, and they were only 800 milliseconds long, so very short. As, as you can imagine, a scream is extremely short. And actually, scream-like music tends to be very short as well, um, which I don't think is an accident. Um, the music excerpts were taken from horror film soundtracks. Um, I did this myself, and uh, unfortunately it means that it was non-blind, but um, it's actually a pretty replicable, uh, 
method, I would say, because when you listen to horror movie soundtracks, there's very clear moments of scream-like music that are extremely brief. And then the rest of the music is either kind of filler music or there's the suspense leading up to the scream-like moment. So it's, it's a pretty, um, it's simpler than you would expect to find these excerpts. And then the vocal excerpts were recorded at the University of Zurich. Participants um, basically did either a fearful scream or a neutral scream. And so we had 50 of each type of stimuli. Um, so for the acoustic analyses, we used MATLAB. We used the same code as um, Luke Arnall used in his 2015 paper. Actually, if you really want to understand how it's measured, I really recommend looking at the supplemental features of his paper. They give a very thorough description of the code. Uh, and then we took the mean amplitude of the roughness range of that 30 to 150 hertz um, range along the temporal modulation uh, axes. And then for the ratings experiment, um, we had 20 participants, 12 were female, and they had no hearing or reported no hearing or psychiatric disorders. They were all from the University of Zurich. They received 15 francs for their participation and the procedure was approved by the local ethics commission. They listened to all 200 audio files in a row in a pseudo randomized order, and they rated the valence and arousal of the conveyed emotion of each audio file. This experiment interface was created in MATLAB with Psych Toolbox. And um, the analyses were done in R. We used a lot of uh, some standard linear regression analyses to look at our data. So the results for, each, uh, for our first hypothesis, this is our nice um, table of, <laughs> of our result. So we um, found that the results demonstrate a significant main effect between the screen likeness and roughness driven by higher roughness values for screen like stimuli as compared to non screen like stimuli across both sound types, which was exciting. Um, similar effect, we, we also looked at voice only uh, to see if we could replicate the findings of, of Luke in 2015, which we did. Additionally, um, the results showed a significant interaction effect between sound type and screen likeness. And this was driven by a more extreme difference in mean roughness values between screaming voices and non-screaming voices compared to scream-like music versus non-scream-like music. So you can see this better in this um, graph here that for voice, which is on the left, you see a much bigger difference in the scream-like power was much higher for roughness, a lot more roughness in screams compared to non-screams. Whereas in the music, there's still a significant difference, but it's not as extreme as it is for the voice. And you can also see this, these are four example MPS um, that graphs taken from our stimuli. And on the right, you have the non-scream-like stimuli, and you can see that there's much less roughness in the non-screaming vocalizations on the top right than for the non-scream-like music on the bottom right. So this sort of mirrors our results. Uh, for our second hypothesis, again, we used R and uh, we looked we used the emotion ratings, valence and arousal um, for our mixed effects models with predictor value being roughness. So again, we're looking at how roughness, roughness correlates with the valence and arousal ratings um, across domains, across music and voice. And we see some results that really nicely aligned with our hypotheses. Um, basically roughness correlated negatively with the valence ratings and positively with arousal ratings for both uh, musical stimuli and vocal stimuli. But again, paralleling what we saw with the acoustic analyses, there was a significant interaction effects uh, between roughness and sound type for both valence and arousal. So both regression slopes were steeper for the vocal sounds than for the music sound type. And you can see this in the graph, the orange is the voice regression line. So those are definitely at a steeper incline than for the music ones. So the ratings are reflecting our results that we found in our um, acoustic analyses as well. So in conclusion, uh, just to recap what we, how our data supports our hypotheses, um, consistent with our hypotheses, the screams and scream-like music both exhibited a higher level of roughness and had more negative valence ratings and higher arousal ratings than non -scream -like, their non-scream-like counterparts. But contrary to our hypotheses, screams had a higher roughness level than scream-like music. And this was interesting to us um, essentially, there's this super expressive voice theory that um, music might be able to uh, convey and, and maybe induce in emotions more at a greater level, like more extremely than the voice is capable of. But our data seems to suggest that perhaps a screen like music 
that's not the case. Maybe it is still more of an imitation um, and kind of muted version of the real thing, but this is just one study for that, so we'll see perhaps something else will we'll change that. Um, but in general, what's exciting is uh, we felt like our results do support this um, theory that we had going into this project that scream like music might scare viewers in part because it is evocative of a human scream. Uh, so future work might test similar hypotheses um, to ours, but maybe directly manipulating the roughness cues instead of um, the way that we went about with our study. Or potentially other researchers could investigate if our findings extend into other music that conveys negative emotions as well. Um, for my own work, uh, I'm investigating how music conveys fear um, in general. So this is just part, uh, just a single device that I've uh, presented today of what I'm looking at overall. Um, if you're interested in the details of this work, we just released a paper on the results in the JAZA um, publication. So there, there it is, <laughs> if you want to go check it out. Um, and also, we have all of our musical stimuli up on Open Science Foundation, if you're curious to listen to those, and if you would like to use them in your own studies on uh, music and fear, if you have those. <laughs> Uh, so we'd like to thank Lawrence Feth, David Huron, and Arkady Kanavala for their help in various stages of this project. And we, this project was funded by Swiss National Science Foundation and the EU. And yeah, those are my references. So that's, that is everything. Thanks so much for listening. Um, thank you, Caitlin. Uh, actually, just before uh, Sophia takes over um, the Q&A, um, I would like to make um, a quick announcement. So um, uh, there was um, a bit of a complication with the Zoom meetings we had already planned for the posters. So um, for those of you in the audience that are poster presenters, um, especially today, you must have received um, an email with new instructions. Um, once uh, this process is completed, so hopefully um, by the end of this uh, oral session, all attendees, all people who have registered, you will receive a new email with um, uh, Zoom meetings for each poster. Um, so do not use um, the links uh, for the posters in the original instructions email from yesterday. There will be a new one and that story is only about the posters today and tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. And on to Sophia now for um, uh, some quick questions. Thank you very much for a nice presentation, Kathleen. Uh, we have some questions. Uh, the first one is by Claudia Fritz. So I will unmute you now and you can put on your video. I think I could unmute you. I couldn't. You unmute yourself maybe? I can do it, yes. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for, for, the, for the nice talk and well presented. Uh, I have a question because um, it's maybe not related, but all your pictures are from um, women uh, screaming. So oh, <laughs> this okay. was a personal choice, actually. I'm sorry, okay. give me your question and I'll tell you. <laughs> I was wondering, I mean, obviously when you, you did your experiments, you recorded uh, men and women screaming, but I was wondering, did you see uh, did you make an analysis? Um, did you separate the two type of voices in your analysis? For example, to see may maybe there would be even more uh, similarity between music screaming and female screams than between uh, uh, scream music and male voice. I don't know if that's... That's, that's a great question. We didn't actually look and see if gender had an impact. So now I really want to do that because that's a great point. We mostly, yeah, we had equal balance of genders in our screams. Um, and uh, I, I'm surprised that we didn't do that. <laughs> Thanks so much for bringing that to my attention. Uh, as far as the pictures go, those were particular like final girls that I admire from horror movies. <laughs> but there's plenty of male screaming in horror movies as well. Um, but that's a great question. I, I'm going to have to investigate that. And I'd like to tell you if I find anything at some point. Okay. Okay, we have one uh, final question from Maya. Uh, can you unmute yourself, please? 
Hey, Caitlin, thank you so much for the great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I just have a pretty straightforward question. Um, do you think, can you think of other types of music where uh, the human voice has been uh, imitated? And in what way, if you can think of uh, something like that, just thank you. That's a great question. Yeah, there's um, quite a few studies on, on this, um, and I think it's becoming a bit more in focus. Uh, the problem is, though, it's usually not so direct as this, right? Um, like, you don't often hear a laughter in music or, I don't know, there's interesting work on melodic um, shapes and vocal intonation. I know my previous advisor, David Huron, is doing work on this currently. Um, but the reason I got interested in horror movie music is I think it's where you're going to hear the most obvious mimicry in music um, compared to any other genre. So if you're interested in more direct instances, that I think is where you will find them. That's where I've been looking. Um, there's like some whispering being mimicked. There's um, maybe even angry voices is being mimicked sometimes in timbre. And right now I'm studying uh, drone tones and um, natural sounds in horror movies that are kind of like that, like earthquake or something like this. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. One that I would love to talk more about like um, in person or not in person, but you know, uh, I could rant about that for a while is what I mean. <laughs> but yeah, I hope that was helpful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. We need to move on. Uh, so I would like to thank you once again uh, for a great talk. Uh, I can see you have some questions in the chat.